I am a bit of a geek and a nerd. I love data. Um, so forgive me if I get overly technical in this. I will try and keep it as relevant as I can. But when we start looking into rankings, what I would encourage universities to think about is not so much the overall position, but actually what the data used in those rankings can tell you about the performance of your institution when compared to others, both within your country, but also looking internationally. And so that's what we're going to try and do in this session. We're going to try and explore what our data tells us about where the UK uh, higher education market is and what some of the challenges are that we see coming up from uh, both the usual rivals but also up and coming countries. And the starting point of this has to be a brief, and I promise you it will be brief, explanation of how we put together our rankings. Uh, this, uh, this is, is called, called a Sankey diagram, diagram, and it shows the flow of data, data. in this case from our three data sources. And those data sources are uh, information we gather from universities themselves. And we're in a very lucky position here in the UK that because of HESA, uh, you provide your data once to HESA, and we're able to take it from there. Uh, let me tell you that in other parts of the world, it is not nearly as simple. We have to go out to universities and ask them to provide data and spend a lot of time trying to ensure the data they provide is actually telling us what we think it should be telling us. So we have the data, the core data on universities. We also have an academic reputation survey. And this goes out every January, and we believe it is the strongest and most robust reputation survey of academics across the world. And I will talk more about that later. And our third set of data, which is the bibliometric data, we take from our, uh, our friends at Elsevier from their Scopus data set. So from those three data sets, we create 13 different measures. And most of those are relative measures. You get nothing particularly for being a large institution. In fact, the top institution in the world, according to our rankings, is Caltech, which is very, very small and very focused. But those 13 measures are then grouped Firstly, we do some z-scoring. I'll not explain that now, but uh, essentially it's a way of allowing us to combine measures that don't measure very similar things. But we combine those into five broad areas that we publish. And the five broad areas are teaching, research, citations, industry income, and international outlook. Most of the focus today is going to be on research, citations, industry income, international outlook in my session. In Nikki's session, after the break, we'll be looking in much more detail about teaching, but not looking at the data from the World University Rankings, looking instead at some of the insights we believe we can get from exploring the TEF and the TEF framework. But our rankings can't cover all of the universities in the world. Um, there are, we believe, somewhere in the region of 21,500 universities across the world. We say we believe because no one actually knows the answer to that question. And when you start trying to find data that is reliable and consistent from universities, you tend to be pushed into the area, when you're looking across international boundaries, at research-focused universities. Research data tends to be much more reliable and consistent across international boundaries. And so to get into our rankings, you need to pass certain thresholds. And the three thresholds we have, firstly, we look for a certain level of productivity in terms of academic papers. We require universities to have 1,000 papers, um, which are either um, conference proceedings, journals, or reviews, uh, over a five-year period. The second requirement is that we're looking for universal institutions, so institutions that aren't focused around a single, very narrow uh, area of research. And the third criteria is that there has to be significant undergraduate teaching. So those are the three uh, major thresholds we have. What does this mean in terms of numbers? Well, the first number is that out of the 21,000-odd universities, we rank about 800 universities. We actually rank 801. There are 800 places. We had a tie for 600th place, which has led to 801 institutions last year. And this represents only 4% of all the universities in the world. It's not to say that if you're not on the list, you aren't a great university. If your mission is primarily teaching, you could be a brilliant teaching university, but you will not necessarily appear 
in our ranking. And the number of universities that we have covered has grown significantly since the first ranking in 2004. Then we listed 200 universities. And there's no surprise that the countries that dominated that ranking were the United States and the United Kingdom. We have grown since then. In 2010, when we moved um, our production to Thomson & Reuters, we expanded the listing to 400 universities. And then last year, when we took control of producing the data and producing the rankings ourselves, we expanded it again to 800. And as Phil has hinted, I'm not going to tell you how many we'll have next year, um, especially because my boss is in the room, and if I say a number, he will make me stick to it. But one of the things we do see looking at this data is that the UK does remarkably well in terms of having leading research institutions. 78 of the 150-odd UK institutions pass our three threshold tests and have made it into the 801. And that is a much higher proportion than for almost any other country until you get to very small countries like Luxembourg, which has one university. Uh, it passes, so they get 100%. Um, but broadly speaking, this is the strongest country in terms of having universities that are generally research focused. And that's a very interesting and important fact, but it does put certain tensions in place. As well as gathering data at the overall university level, however, we also look at data in broad, what we call broad subject categories. Uh, up until this year, we had six broad subject categories. They are physical sciences, life sciences, clinical and health, arts and humanities, engineering and, engineering and technology, and social sciences. And I'm quite glad I managed to get through without forgetting any of them. This year, we will be expanding that by splitting social sciences so we have a separate business and economics section. We'll also be splitting computer science out of engineering and technology. And we're the only rankings provider that actually has that depth of detail and enables a deeper look into broad subject areas. In addition, we'll be starting to explore an even more detailed level because the students who come to explore our site and investigate universities aren't interested in the broadness of physical sciences. They want to know, does a university teach physics? So we'll be expanding that into 31 more detailed category areas. So in terms of the data itself then, let's start digging into that. And the first area I want to explore is reputation. Reputation is often seen as uh, the most contentious and most challenging of all the data sets. Uh, people say this is subjective, uh, which is always interesting as a data person. I'm always slightly amused at that as if people view other pieces of data as truly objective. Let me assure you, all data has a degree of subjectivity and a degree of objectivity. Uh, but this is actually a really important area, no matter how subjective it is. This is brand. And anyone who thinks that brand isn't important should look at the amount of money that Coca-Cola, for example, have spent over the years in maintaining their position. And for those of you who have universities with marketing department, ask them about the blind taste testings between Pepsi and Coke and how people still went to buy Coke even though they preferred the taste of Pepsi. So how do we put together the reputation survey? Well, every year we start with the Scopus data set. And the Scopus data set has not just the journals, articles, and citations. It's also effectively a list of active researchers. And that's our base population. We select people randomly from that base population, and we invite them to contribute to the survey. And we balance it by geography. We want to make sure that this survey accurately reflects the spread of researchers around the world. In order to do that, we use data from UNESCO and the OECD, which tell us uh, rough numbers of researchers by country. And we balance both on the output, making sure we send enough surveys out to each different country, but also after the fact on the input. So if we find, for example, that people in the US are overly keen on telling us their opinions, whereas people in China are less keen, we will upweight the Chinese votes and slightly downweight the US votes. This year, we received 10,323 responses, and people voted for over 2,500 different institutions. Uh, in fact, I was really pleased to see, for the first time, we had a vote for um, the Antarctic Research Institution, so we can genuinely claim that we've had votes for all seven continents. It's the first time I've ever been able to claim that. Um, so that's a really positive insight. 
We're also asking the academics to tell us who they think the best universities are in their particular subject. And that again gives us another way of analyzing the data. We can start to look and see if a particular university is strong in physics or in biology or in German literature. And reputation does change. These are the ranks of the two leading Chinese universities over the last um, six years now, from 2011. Reputation does not stay constant. And let me be clear about this. The UK and the US have benefited for a long time from having universities that are ancient, that have a great tradition, and that has helped support their reputation. I went to a, a small Finland university that you probably haven't heard of, but that university undoubtedly still gets reputation because of Isaac Newton, who, to be honest, hasn't produced any leading research in the last 400 years. And that's the truth. That's the way that reputation works. It's a very lagging indicator. But we can see from this that that kind of inbuilt advantage isn't going to last forever. When we explore where votes come from, we see some very interesting things. This is looking at the top um, seven institutions by the number of votes received across the world. And one of the things we see when we look at the leading world institutions is that they truly are world, they truly have worldwide support. Harvard gets more votes from Asia than it does from North America. Um, in fact, last year when we had a, a subsidiary question which was uh, name the best institution uh, in your region that you haven't already mentioned, Harvard kept getting mentioned even when the region concerned was Asia or Africa or Europe. Clearly places it doesn't actually exist. So we see this, we see that leading institutions get votes from across the world. At least most of them do. This is, and I'm sorry, I'm, I'm going to make you do a little bit of work here. This is a plot which uh, tests out the Eurovision theory. So the Eurovision theory is, yes, you get some votes, but don't you get most of your votes from your home country? So what I have on the, uh, oh, I have a laser pointer. What I have on the uh, x-axis is where universities came, just looking at reputation in our ranking system. And on the y-axis, I have the percentage of votes that they receive from within their own country. The different colors represent different continents. So this is where you have to do some work. I'm going to ask some questions. So as you can see, the blue continent typically get many, many votes from outside their own countries. So does anyone want to guess which continent that is, apart from the THE table who have heard this several times? Any guesses? You need to guess a little louder. I heard Europe. You are correct, whoever said that. The blue dots are Europe. Uh, there are two exceptions. European uh, institutions who get most of their votes from their own country. Any guesses? Think of a European country, very proud of itself. Oxford and Cambridge. Ox it's not Oxford and Cambridge, please. <laughs> actually, Oxford and Cambridge are there. Um, I like the way you're thinking, but um, actually, it's Russia. Now, you may, you may like an Oxford and Cambridge to um, Russian institutions, but actually, they're moderately different. Uh, that's uh, Lomonosov State University, and that's St. Petersburg. So uh, it's a question whether they should be in Europe or not. Um, ask Vladimir. The green dots, if the blue dots are Europe, the green dots are America, absolutely. And you can say that there's a reasonable, a, a good reason to that. It's a big country. Uh, there's a lot of call for in-country voting. What about the red ones then? We've got, not got many continents left. It is not Antarctica. Asia. And this is an interesting factor. Asian universities tend to get more of their votes from in-country than almost any other region. There are a few exceptions. Hong Kong, Taiwan, Singapore. Very, very international in outlook. So there's some challenges around this data. Um, but it is interesting data. And remember I said that we can look at this not just by uh, country of origin, but also by area of recognition, in this case, looking at the eight broad subject areas that we're dealing with. So we have arts and humanities at the top, social sciences, business and economics, clinical and health, life sciences, 
physical sciences, engineering, and computer science. And this is Cambridge. Of all its votes, Cambridge gets most recognition for the physical sciences and the life sciences. I'm about to show you Oxford. Difference or the same? I had lots of difference. Difference? The same? Meg, which way did you go? The person from Cambridge went different. Here's Oxford. <laughs> Despite their claims, <laughs> Oxford and Cambridge, to the outside world anyway, look very similar. But as we look at other universities, we see something slightly different. If we bring in Imperial College, Imperial College, no surprise there, it's an engineering and physical science institution. If we look at uh, UCL, we're back to something which looks much more in the uh, Oxford and Cambridge mode. Edinburgh, uh, again, this very drawn out, long uh, focus on humanities. Uh, and Manchester, maybe slightly more engineering and interestingly enough, business and economics coming to the fore again there. But broadly speaking, if you look across all of the UK institutions, we seem to cover more or less everything. Different institutions have different specialisms, true, but there is a lot of diversity there within the UK higher education sector. And remember what I said before, that UK universities tend to be quite well-rounded. They tend to do lots of different things. If I was to show you Asian universities, we would see something very different. When we look at Asian universities, we see a shape that looks like this. A very teardrop shape pull into engineering. Arts and humanities, social sciences get very little look in in the Asian market. So that's a little bit about reputation. What else can we see from the data? Well, what I want to explore now are the 13 other metrics and see what they can tell us about how the UK is performing, where it is doing well, and where it is facing future challenges. But just before I do that, I thought I'd explore this idea of groupings. We like to see these uh, universities pulling together into common groups. And so I did some analysis based on, well, actually, I got one of my teams to do the analysis because he's a better mathematician than I am. Uh, we did some analysis of data across all 800 universities. What we did is we took information on their citation scores in the eight, six subject areas of last year and also on their um, uh, reputation scores in the six subject areas. And we clustered the data. We let the data tell us which groups existed. And lo and behold, the groupings that came out were not the groupings that you have necessarily self-organized into. In fact, the UK is widely represented across quite a few of the 10 different clusters we found. The most traditional cluster, the Old Stars, actually has seven institutions in it internationally and it contains Oxford and Cambridge. But sitting just below that, we have three groups, International Powerhouse, Technology Challenges and Life Science Challenges. These are universities that are performing exceptionally well on the world stage, but have particular focuses. So International Powerhouse sits just under the, uh, the Old Stars group. They are a little less arts and humanities focused. They are a little more technology focused. And uh, interestingly enough, the top university in the world university rankings, Caltech, sits in the International Powerhouse group. The life sciences and the physical sciences challenges are more specialized still. Life science challenges tend to have more of a focus on clinical and health technology around engineering and technology. But as you can see, the UK university is very well distributed there. So let's drill down a little bit into some of these measures. Uh, and let's explore the data from the, that's provided by universities. And also the data that comes from Elsevier. I want to spend a few minutes explaining how we deal with the uh, citations data, because it is an area that is uh, perhaps the most complex. The data we receive from Elsevier um, comes from their Scopus data set. And the Scopus data set has, in the region, over the five years we look at, in the region of 11.3 million publications and papers and approximately 52 million citations. However, we know from exploring the data that different subject areas have very different traditions of publication and traditions of citation. So clinical health, for example, has a very high rate of publication and a high rate of citation. And it's important to us that the measure we use doesn't just simply tell us how many medical researchers does a university have. 
So in order to make this a fair measure, we use a measure called field-weighted citation impact. And the goal of this is to normalize within 344 detailed subject areas, so we have a normal level of citation in that subject area, and then for every single paper, we compare it to that benchmark, and we give it a score, whether it's above or below, and we can then average that across the university. So hopefully that gives us a solid measure of the citation performance. It does mean that you can have a situation where you have a few exceptional researchers doing brilliant work, but when you look at the overall picture, actually your score is lowered by a large number of researchers doing less excellent work. Let's start to explore the data in detail. Here we have what the UK looks like in terms of its international measures. So the three international measures we have are the percentage of international staff, the percentage of international students, and the number of internationally co-authored papers. And what I'm showing you there is a, um, a screenshot from within our data product, and it's showing a box and whiskers plot. A box and whiskers plot, if you like, is a way of looking down at the distribution of data. So imagine you're looking at a uh, Gaussian distribution from above. The line in the middle is the median value. The bottom and top of the box represent the 25th percentile and the 75th percentile, so most of the data will be within those bounds. And then the top and bottom of the whiskers represent one and a half times the interquartile range. In other words, I would expect most of the other examples to be within there, but you can have a few outliers as well. So those box and whisker plots represent all of the 78 UK institutions within our world university rankings. The dots themselves actually are specific institutions. These are the top UK institutions. I believe the black dot is uh, Oxford University. Um, and if you were seeing this in the live tool, then hovering over a dot would give you the name and show you all the other points for that particular institution. So what can we see here? Well, the UK does very, very well on these international measures. And that's no surprise, I suspect, to anyone in this room. The UK has been leading the world in terms of recruitment of international students. Um, and that is both a strength, in the sense that it gives our universities a very diverse and powerful learning environment, but it's also a vulnerability. Depending on what happens today, for example, elsewhere, we might suddenly find the position in terms of international students is challenged. We've already seen when the government changes its rules about visas, that can have a very significant and sudden impact on our educational establishments. But let's look at it not just standalone, but compared to some other countries. Here's how we do when compared to the USA. The answer is much better. In particular, I want to point, point out the difference in terms of international co-authorship. And you might wonder why we at Times Higher Education put an emphasis on international co-authorship. Well, the reason is that not only do we believe that research that is co-authored across international boundaries tends to be stronger, there is actually data that backs that up. Elsevier have done research onto this, and papers that involve international cooperation are much more highly cited than those that don't. Now, anyone involved in data will tell you there may be some inherent biases in that. If I have two universities involved in the research, I have two groups of people who are interested in citing that research. There may also be a factor of um, thresholds to get research approved. Perhaps I need a higher threshold to get international research approved than I do just research within my own team. Nevertheless, it is clear from the data that these papers are much more effective. In terms of international staff and international students, the US does less well. Uh, the US has been faced by a particular challenge in its state system lately, which is the pressure to ensure that domestic students from the home state have an opportunity to go to the colleges. And so, for example, California has recently passed some legislation that prevents them having more than a certain percentage of out-of-state students in their state schools. If we look at Germany, again, we see that the percentage of international staff in Germany is lower. Now, this is partly because, unless you can speak German, you're probably not going to get a, um, and speaking German is a challenge, I've been led to believe, um, by my German neighbor. Unless you can speak German, it's more challenging to get a job in Germany. Also, the percentage of international students is lower. Having said that, these numbers are changing quickly. Increasingly, German universities are both teaching in English, but also actively driving the search for international students. 
Simply saying that people will come to the UK because we teach in English isn't going to be the case for much longer. Moving on to the next set of measures, research inputs, well, and to a degree, research outputs. How does the UK fare here? Well, um, we do okay in terms of research reputation. In fact, some of our universities do exceptionally well. Our leading universities have a great international reputation. Uh, research income, which as we know is led by the REF, is what I would call left skewed. There is a large bulk of universities that have a relatively similar amount, and we have a few at the top here who are doing much better. And one thing to say about all the financial measures, by the way, when I do international comparisons, we have used a measure of purchase price parity to make sure that I can generally compare the, uh, the amount of money available in one country to another country. So purchase price parity basically gives you an equivalence of purchasing power. In papers to academic staff, we have a wide variation in the UK. We have some universities that are doing very well and others which are not doing so well. Again, let's look at this compared to the United States. Well, what do we see? Well, the first one is one I will keep coming back to, I'm afraid. It's income. At the end of the day, our ability to produce excellent research and to produce fantastic universities is tied to the amount of money available to us. And the reality is that when we compare ourselves with the USA, Although, as I've hinted at before, they actually have a very diverse system with both um, uh, public institutions, public not-for-profit, private not-for-profit, and even private for-profit institutions. Nevertheless, on the whole, the purchasing price parity, the amount of money we have available for research, is significantly lower than it is in the US. Uh, reputation is slightly stronger in the US. Um, uh, papers to academic staff, it's a mixed picture. To be honest, I think that the UK is in a slightly stronger position there than the US is. Again, let's look at Germany. Yet again, we see that actually in terms of funding, Germany is doing much, much better. In fact, the skew is almost the other way around. There's a slight word of caution here. Whereas I have every single UK institution in this data set, I don't have every single German institution. But that doesn't necessarily work in the UK's favor. Some of the institutions I don't have in here are research-focused institutions like the Max Planck institutions, which would probably push that even higher. So again, we have a, a challenge here. Is our sector appropriately funded? It certainly doesn't seem to be as well-funded as Germany and the UK, sorry, and the USA. But I'm now going to pull in a third country, China. Surely we're doing better than China. Well, the answer is yes, but only just. If you look at the Chinese, or well, in fact, you could argue no, but only just. Uh, if you look at the Chinese research income, even in China, the funding is starting to flow into higher education, and that puts us at risk here in the UK. However, having said that, China is still very reputationally weak. This is partly because they are relying significantly on in-country voting. People outside China are not necessarily seeing the great Chinese research. That isn't, by the way, because they're publishing in Mandarin. When you look at Chinese universities, you will see that they are being increasingly given um, actual cash bonuses to publish in prestigious English language journals. So we're, I'm no doubt we will see the research reputation of the broad sweep of Chinese universities, not just Tsinghua and Peking, improving as years go by. The next two, two um, measures we'll look at, citation impact, and industry income. Citation impact is one where the UK does really quite strongly. We do gain the benefit of publishing in English, and that isn't to be underestimated. When I went to a conference in Malaysia, uh, the Malaysian University was essentially making the decision that, to be honest, to be taken seriously in academia, we need to publish in English, even though there are challenges in doing that. But we can't rely on that lasting indefinitely. As I just said, the Chinese institutions are starting to publish in English. The Malaysian institutions will go the same way. And as they do that, the citation impact scores that the UK research does will not benefit purely from the fact that they're published in English. Our industry income measure is also not the best. When we compare this with the USA, our industry income is comparable. It's not totally dissimilar. 
But our citation scores are slightly lower. Again, the caveat there is that although I have all the UK institutions, I actually only have a, most of the R1 institutions and a few of the R2 institutions in the USA. So it's a slightly distorting effect there. If I look at Germany, though, I see a very different picture. German universities have a much stronger track record of linking into industry income. They have made that much more effective link. And in China, again, we see this very strong measure. Industry income, although it's only a small proportion of our measure in the world university ranking, is an area where Asian universities in, particularly, in particular have a fantastic focus. Korea, uh, in Korea, for example, there is a university that is actually effectively owned by a corporation. Okay, they provide all of the funding and uh, a lot of the income, particularly in research. The final area I'll look at, and hopefully keep myself to time, is around teaching. Now, we acknowledge that the teaching metrics we have in the World University Ranking are more limited than we would like. We would love to be able to look at uh, much more deep university teaching metrics across international boundaries, but as we all know, that's a very challenging thing to do. But the five, in, five measures we do have um, do provide us some insight into what's going on. First thing I can say is at the moment, broadly speaking, institutional income per uh, member of staff is very tightly grouped in the UK because we have a consistent funding mechanism. That may, of course, change slightly with the TEF, but at the moment, that is a very tightly grouped measure. Um, similarly, in terms of doctorates to bachelors awarded. So uh, we have that in there, this idea that um, uh, it's based very much around the idea that Phil loves, that uh, universities where you can link research to teaching and teaching at the undergraduate level are better learning environments. But again, there's a lot of consistency there in the UK. UK institutions seem to have a very consistent view on that. And similarly, around the number of students to academic staff. And that, of course, again, is tightly linked to funding. When we look at the UK versus the USA, no surprise, institutional income per member of staff is both more varied, uh, and that's not all a good story from the US, by the way. If you look at the state systems, they are under immense cash pressure at the moment, and they are suffering hugely from that. But we're also seeing um, an extension there. The USA has some of the wealthiest endowments and the wealthiest universities in the world, and they do make uh, good use of that. Students to academic staff is much more distributed as well, and that largely follows those measures of income. When we look at Germany, we see a very different picture. For a start, the, doctorates that they, the number of doctorates they award shows a very different focus in their universities to our universities, uh, a very strong postgraduate feel. Their institutional income is both higher and more widely distributed than ours is. Um, but the students to academic staff ratio is lower. Now, this is one of those interesting measures, students to academic staff, because on the one hand, the concept is that if I have a good staff to student ratio, it puts me in a better position to teach. It doesn't guarantee I will teach well, but if I have lots of staff, then hopefully they can interact with my students. Uh, yet, at the other hand, you could argue it encourages inefficiency, because if I'm relying on having tons of staff per student, then I'm not looking for the most effective way to teach and impart knowledge. It's clear that Germany is very different from the UK in this. They're not so worried about uh, the student-staff ratio. They, have they often have um, uh, very different admissions approaches, and that has an impact on that data. In China, what do we see? Well, the Chinese actually are doing better than we are in terms of staff-to-student ratio. Although they have very large institutions, although those institutions are often relatively modern, they're actually focusing on low numbers of students per member of staff. But as before, their reputation is lagging. Now, that again is also a factor of their age. Young universities have an inherent disadvantage when it comes to reputation. So with that, I'll just leave you with my, uh, my concluding thoughts, and then we can open the floor to some questions. And the first thought is really that um, we face some challenges as the UK higher education sector, both internal challenges, but also challenges from institutions outside our own country. Um, the best international students aren't frightened of taking our ideas, taking the things we've been doing well, and building on those. 
As I mentioned, Germany is actively pushing for international students. Um, universities like the University of Luxembourg, obviously they have to get international students because there aren't enough people in Luxembourg, but they are driving very hard to make themselves an attractive place for English-speaking students to visit and study. Um, France is becoming much more universal. France, if you don't know, is going through a huge change where their 720 universities are being coalesced into 26 super university groups. And it's fundamentally breaking away from the Napoleonic model to something much more like the UK model of universal teaching. Other systems, however, are also facing challenges. Japan is facing a shortage of under 18s. And this is going to leave them in a position where they either have to find new international students or they have to close down some universities. They don't have much choice there. And the USA is facing this very real question, which I believe we're going to face as well, around value for money. If you're paying $52,000 a year to study at Duke, are you going to get that $52,000 a year back when you graduate? And that's why the USA has started publishing data such as College Scorecard, which actually looks at measures of indebtedness and value-added return on investment. And the final thing I'd like to say is that actually, despite the failure of a halo, despite, despite the failure of a halo, both as something that can be pronounced and as a, a program, there will be, I believe, an increasing focus on trying to understand the success of teaching and the teaching mission across international boundaries. And we have some ideas about how we might approach that in the future in order to try and get some kind of idea about the excellence of teaching. And we're going to be exploring, at least in the context of the UK, as we look at Nikki's session on the TEF, a little more about that. But this is clearly an area which will allow us to understand not just the 4% of the world's universities, which are the leading research mission universities, but the much larger group going to many more countries who are the leading lights in terms of teaching. With that, thank you very much.